Today is Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. Today we talk about to, let's see, uh, if you don't worship God, then by default, you must worship Satan. And it takes way longer to try to get people to understand the simplicity of that. It's it's a dichotomy, a true dichotomy. It's a binary position if you're, the switch is on or off. If it's not on, it's off. There is no middle. There's no like putting the switch in the middle. It's like, or yeah, it's a binary choice. So if you don't worship God, the only other thing you can do is worship Satan. And they're like, what do you mean? You mean, what if, how do they worship something if they're like an atheist and they don't believe in a Satan? Practically speaking, like they're not walking around in black robes like, yeah, hey, Satan. Um, but they're worshiping something other than God. Again, whether they know it or not or admit it or not, that's the Christian worldview. Anyway, so then we talk about Trinity versus modalism, and it's even worse. <laughs> um, so usually we do a better job of not just like meandering on, but... Um, I don't know. I was thinking about Taco Tuesday today, and that's where my, uh, what, that, maybe that's bad, right? Like, where your heart is, that's where your whatever will be. Well, my, my heart was kind of on Taco Tuesday today, so I'm, I'm headed out to eat some, some of that. Um, anyway, so we let this go on for a while. It's been a, uh, it's been a while since we've went this, like, meandering and just, like, uh, and, like, mind skull numbing territory. But don't be discouraged. If you like these debates, um, this is your thing. Um, it's not really my thing. I like to get to the point, right? Repent, believe the gospel, get eternal life. Done. Now you never have to worry about to what degree one sin is less or worse than another. Um, doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. If you're a Christian, how I sometimes often say, if you're a Christian, today's discussion is about as close to hell as you'll get. Um, it's actually not that bad. Um, there's been worse ones. <laughs> anyway, so uh, then we talk about someone else that wants to debate an atheist, and they claim victory and run around while the atheist is just like, you didn't win. I don't agree to what you said. And and he's like, I won. I won. <laughs> so it's just one of those days. Anyway, check out the Ask a Christian book on Amazon if you'd like and the Ask a Christian merchandise uh, shop. The links are in the description. Support this podcast. We appreciate it. Keep us going. And most days, sharing the gospel with people on the internet. So whatever happens today, <laughs> give us another chance. <laughs> um, tacos are on my mind. All right, that's where I'm going. Take care, everyone. Have an awesome day. Bye. Um, well, to, uh, Moshi says, so focusing on the uniqueness of each individual is a bad thing? No, but consider the source. So even the Bible talks about, you know, how each person has a different function within the collective body of Christ. So you are unique. So, uh, you know, uh, the Bible says one person may be a hand, one people is a foot, one person is an eye or something like that. So individualism and uniqueness is a thing. But it's all part of the larger collective, which is to help the body of Christ in the kingdom of heaven versus like you yourself as the end all be all like effectively you're your own God. So you're not doing anything for the greater collective. You're not doing anything in service of a God because these people we're talking about would deny they, you know, they would say they lack a belief in a God. So ultimately they are their own God. They're their own authority. Um, Can I add one thing to that uh, real quick, Nate, in like 10 seconds? Yes, 10 nine okay so unity and diversity and diversity and unity is how we understand the world period right if you focus on unity without diversity you get totalitarianism craziness if you focus on diversity without unity you're going to get heightened individualism and independence in the biblical view there is a celebration of unity and a celebration of diversity simultaneously when we talk about worship of self it is The worship of self at the expense of the community. And that's not something I've ever heard Jordan Peterson or any any other sort of God believing or traditional value person do. They always celebrate the individual within the context of the community, because what is a cell outside of the body? It's dead. And he says, uh, so does the the the, right? Oh, oh, hang on. Let me. Sorry, just, question. Uh, Moshi, if you can yeah. if you can speak, Moshi, like feel free to come up. That'd be a lot easier than reading comments. Uh, let me fill up my water. I promise it's just filtered water. Um, <laughs> but he says, uh, so does the devil force people to go down a bad path, or does he merely influence people? Uh, well, I don't think he forces. Like, I mean, there's a few things. One, like when I said earlier, like you know, people give the devil too much credit when they're like, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Uh, well, you probably had a hand in that yourself. Um, so you know, the devil's not omnipresent. <laughs> he could only mess with so many people at so many times. Um, but the Bible says, you know, whenever you do sin, it's because you've given a temptation, you're driven away by your own lusts and your own desires. 
So, you know, I think the devil, you know, holds significant influence over this world, but how much he or something like that is specifically messing with you. Um, I, I think, you know, we're a lot more accountable to our own will than being like, well, the dog ate my homework. <laughs> the devil made me do it. Um, so I would, I would think that. Oh, what were you going to say, Jen? No, I was just uh, mentioning what uh, Marcus mentioned, the uh, uh, unity in diversity, something like that. It reminded me, I think, uh, of the doctrine of the Trinity, you know, that you have one God but three persons, and you need to have the Son so God can be in the action of loving. So this God is not just like on himself, but he needs to have a communion with his creation, right? And that's the beauty and the difference of the Christian God in comparison to any other religion. Uh, Moshi, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'm just curious, to what extent uh, does the devil um, affect uh, events in the world? There's no way to specifically allocate how much is like human behavior, demon behavior, devil behavior. <laughs> I mean, we can say a good fair bit, but to, to allocate exactly how much, there's no way no one will ever figure I that mean, out. I mean, sin. Sin is it is it caused <clears> by the <throat> devil? Is it caused by our own bad desires within us well both yeah i just talked about that like so, i mean romans one talks about how humans invented new ways to do evil so like if you read romans one like apparently there are sins <clears throat> that even the devil wasn't clever enough to invent humans invented new sins all on their own so yeah we're pretty good at being bad so, I mean, you said earlier that um, anyone who goes down a bad path, and I don't remember your exact words, is he's worshipping the devil or something of the sort. No, it, but if... Yeah, it, it's a binary choice. Like, I, mm -hmm. I think we, I think you were maybe getting too hung up on, like, you know, the worship and, and this, thinking like it's a religious devotion. Like, in order to worship the devil, you must be, like, pledging allegiance, believing he exists, like, doing his evil deeds for him or something mm -hmm. like that. But we're saying it's it's a binary choice. So if you don't worship God, there's only one other position that can be, and that is worshiping quote worshiping Satan. So there there would be theistic Satanists who legit fit your description of worship, but there would be every other you know religion or atheist who doesn't worship the Jesus of the Bible, and effectively they are giving their allegiance to the devil, whether they know it or not, whether they admit it or not. That's what's happening because there is no other place for them to go. Like, there is no middle ground, there is no other option. That's why we say that. Um, got it. I just, if you're saying that a lot of uh, evil can simply be ascribed to um, the evil within humanity, humanity uh, like, why does it necessarily have to be ascribed to the devil in that case? Well, I think I'm because really the sure devil what you're is... Saying, but I mean, it's either or. Yeah, go ahead, Marquise. No, I was just going to say, again, it goes back to the place of origin, right? Um, so regardless of whatever nuances we have, you know, within any kind of democratic republic, there is like the father of democracy, right? You know, the, the, the Greek philosopher who first coined the phrase or came up with the concept of people choosing and voting. So whatever ideas people come up with on how to institute democracy now, Ultimately, there's going to be a measure of tribute to the person who started it all, right? Um, and there, there's sort of a sense of, of origin, of source, or progenation in that sense. So, for instance, even Jesus says, when he calls the Pharisees the children of Satan, right? He says, you are of your father, the devil, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And when he tells a lie, he speaks of himself, right? Right? So we know, by at least if, we, if, if the Bible is going to be believed, that lying progenied, uh, uh, progenated or originated from the devil. Devil's the first one to tell a lie, okay? So regardless of however many people lie, the act of lying is going to be attributed to the person who started the lie. And by started the lie, I mean started or originated the concept of lying, right? Um, and so that's, that's an example, right? If, if Satan is the source of presenting some alternative view, right? If you look at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, everything's in order. God made everything. Everything's good. Everything's serving him. Everything's consistent with his good name, his purpose. Then in Genesis 3, the devil comes in and provides an alternate reality. Hey, 
You don't have to do exactly what God says. You can do your own thing. He is the source of independence, the source of individualism, the source of other. If you think about, you know, everything is in order and consistent with the nature of God and the, his purpose. He is the source of the concept of doing something outside of God's nature. So anytime you do something outside of God's nature, it is ascribing to his original idea, his original alternate reality that doesn't really exist. That is just a concept where something or someone can exist apart from God and apart from God, uh, God sustaining them through consistency with him. Right. So if you look uh, at Genesis Moshe. 3, he's the guy. Yeah, go ahead and follow up and then we'll get to the other people who have been waiting. Uh, Moshe, do you want to respond to that? Um, a few things. So first of all, um, so let's say the um, devil, let's say, let's say he didn't exist. That means human beings would be incapable of lying or other bad uh, activities that are influenced by the devil. Uh, so you've got a lot of feedback. Can you mute when you're not speaking? I think it's so. It's so. Yeah, it is so. I said so. Uh, so you heard the question? Yeah. So yeah. <clears throat> oh, go ahead. Well, yeah, and I, I, I want to move on to Yvette and the other people, and we can keep talking about this, but just to address everyone. But what, first of all, there's no way to know. Like, we're trying to philosophize. Like, if the devil never existed, if God never created the devil, would humans still be able to sin? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. not uh, there's no way to possibly know that, because the devil was created, and the devil does exist. So we just don't know. I, th I think you could probably ar make a decent argument for both reasoning, but we don't know, because, like, things could look very, very different in this created universe if Satan never existed but uh yvette you've been up here for a little while what's on your mind today or are you just hanging out with us yeah i have a question um that was on my mind yesterday uh how is it how is it righteous how, how is god righteous to extend grace to murderers uh to evildoers to prostitutes to uh, all sorts of pedophiles it's like you know the part in the bible where i don't know what it was it barbados who who <clears throat> got released um from you know uh the chart of of his crimes you know um in order to free jesus um in, in order to free him so that jesus would be crucified so it, it's like that is the type of grace that god extends to those types of people i i just don't see how that is righteous i don't know like i, I was just thinking like how is that righteous well That's jesus like makes it. a point of saying he who's been forgiven much loves much so these people probably have a lot of love chris would you like to take that as a former male prostitute who has received forgiveness from god would you like to uh speak to that yeah i mean i'm i am stunningly good looking. <laughs> so um so yvette so the idea here is that we are somehow better than any of those folks. And the way that God sees all human beings, he sees them equally as sinners. And the justice that he does is that he takes their sin upon himself. So when Jesus took our sin in his body, 1 Peter 2.24, he was paying for all of the believers' sins. Now, if you repent and believe whether or not like Paul was a murderer, right? Paul was a murderer. Um, David was a murderer. Um, you know, th th there's no end of horrendous people who did horrendous things throughout the scripture that God chose to justify, right? And so is it just that murderers and, you know, rapists and all these other people, you know, get to experience grace um yes in one sense and no in another yes in the sense that all of us are just as bad as those folks because we sin all of the time when you understand the holiness of god then you understand just how wretched every one of us is and it is not just in another sense um because god is is giving us grace where we deserved none. And 
And so he is withholding his justice and then pouring that justice out onto Jesus. And so, you know, is now, is that a just act? Yes, he's pouring out his wrath on Jesus on the cross to pay for our sins so that his justice and wrath would be satisfied. Because all sin is against God. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> so you're, you're saying um, that our sins, like, you know, we're not pedophiles or murderers. Are you saying it's just as bad as the, I don't know if I'm understanding correct, you correctly, or, uh, as murderers and pedophiles. And, uh, yes, we are just oh, as bad. Like, as let's just oh, say we are yeah. all murderers because we all kill Christ. Like it's our sin that put him there, so we can we can just say we are all murderers in the spiritual sense. We have all murdered, so oh, it's not yeah. like we've just told one little bitty lie. It's like our sin nailed Jesus to the cross. We killed oh, Jesus. Oh wow! Oh wow! Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, well, now I understand. I'm very curious about that. Um, I know uh, well, hang on, Moshi. <clears throat> um, well, yeah, Yvette, we'll uh, give you a minute to digest that. But Chris, um. Did you say today is the day you're in my nick of the woods? Or did I misremember that? No, it's going to be Thursday. Okay, we'll have to we'll have to see just how far uh, we would have to drive to to hang out. And Todd, are you um are you are you good or are you you like swimming in in water or is your situation like that seemed pretty dour? If you're speaking. All right, well let us know. Hope everything is going good with your flooring situation um let's see yeah moshi since you had a question about this go ahead and then we'll, we'll get to good adult and see what they have to say but yeah moshi since your question was about this go ahead yeah uh, you said that um, we're all murderers because we all uh sinned and therefore nailed uh christ to the cross so like i'm just curious that means that um that technically like in God's eyes, like let's say we sin, we look at it, we look at a woman with lust or anything like that. Um, that means we're on the same level as let's as let's say an actual murderer. Well, yes, I, I would say Jesus, that that's what Jesus teaches. Yes. Yeah, but then so, before someone try, well, before someone tries to like say, so you mean we're exactly the same then as Hitler? Because if you kill one person, is that the same as killing millions of people? Don't think of it that way. Think that. The person who managed to tell one little bitty lie is not exactly like the guy who killed, you know, millions of people. But both of them are so far away from God who is sinless that you may as well be just a bunch of Hitlers. But yeah, what Chris said is true. Um, but before we start like trying to quantify it and be like, well, do you really mean that this, like, you know, if I only killed 10 million people, am I just as bad as the guy that killed 70 million people? Wrong question. But yeah, I agree with what Chris said. Uh, good adult, what's up, man? How are you? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What's on your mind today? Do you have anything? I do. Um, um, I was in a conversation with some Trinitarians uh, at work the other day, and I had a question that they couldn't. They posed a question, um, and I, I wanted to pose it to you. Uh, can you first? Can you give me Nate? Nate, could you give me your understanding of modalism from from how it's been taught or how you've studied it, Nate? What is your understanding of modalism? Uh, there may be some discrepancies in the way different people would uh, would define their own modalist views, but generally, God has different modes. So at one at one point, um, at one instance, He may be the Father, and then at another mode or uh, state, He may be the Son, and then He would be the Spirit. So it would be like, I mean, as the name suggests, different modes. So you would af you would affirm modalism, and, and would you qualify yourself as a modalist? No, I believe in God's triune. All right, there's sequential modalism and there's simultaneous modalism. Both are heresies that were thrown out of the church early on. Um, this is a topic I'm very curious about. Uh, I just want to finish if I could. Just, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, you got it, brother. Um, so I'm. Uh, uh, this is similar to the conversation I was having the other day. I think with my coworkers. Um, so you're not a modalist, but he, but God does have modes, or he does not have modes, Nate. No, God does not have nodes. I wasn't explaining that for my belief. You asked me what my understanding of modes right, okay. is. Okay. Okay. So, but he does not. You're saying he does not. Okay. Cool. Correct. So, uh, um, 
uh, and so if that is the case, if you could give me your understanding, it, uh, it seems to me this is a question where uh, uh, Isaiah 9 and 6 uh, gives certain uh, titles. Um, would those titles that are that are given to uh, the Son of Man, would those titles be modes? If they are not modes, what would you do qualify those titles as? Titles. They're, re they're referring to his essence. They're not referring to a specific person. So they're referring to his ontological makeup in being equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So in, in Isaiah 9, 6, where it calls the Son of God the everlasting Father, this is not a an idea of economy. This is an idea of ontology. And for the Richter, it's just like when it, you know, when it calls Jesus the Son of Man, and people will use that and say, see, he's only a human. And that would just be a wrong understanding of that. Well, I wouldn't say only, but he is a human, or he was a human, was he not? He yeah, is. we're we're focusing on the only. Right. Right. I, I, not, I, I, hold on, I can't I can't do two at once. Forgive me. No, just no. I just want to make sure I understand the Nate's position uh, because it's, I'm going to hopefully be able to bring this back to my coworker to, uh, later today. Um, and I appreciate the, in, the understanding and the teaching, Nate. Um, just to so understand that he was a human and being a human would be a mode or would not be a mode no what would being be, what would being a human be then if it's not a mode for god what would it be when god is a human what what would if he's not in a particular mode what would you qualify him being in i mean so Nature. the right term would be the, the right the right term would be the incarnation i mean if if you want to like somehow like you know you know make your case and define it um what I just said, like the incarnation when God, you know, took on flesh and became man. If you want to define that in a way where then you can use the word mode, I mean, I guess you could do that. But that's not talking about modalism, the theology doctrine at all. So, I mean, if you if you wanted to like define Jesus becoming human and then say, see, that's a mode of God. Well, that's still not in any way talking about modalism, the doctrine. So. The definition, excuse me, using the term there, mode would be would be would fit, but then that wouldn't qualify as modalism. So the word would fit there. I would not be um, misusing the English language if I was to say he's in the would mode be. of being a human. Correct? Yeah, no, no, no. That is an incorrect category error. You cannot say that about Jesus. That is what we're saying. So the the correct Christian doctrine is that Jesus, in the hypostatic union, took on an additional human nature to the second person of the Trinity, to each person, not to the essence. If Jesus is the Father, and totalism is true, then all of Christian doctrine is destroyed. This is why modalism is such a silly heresy, is because it destroys the atonement and it destroys the work of Christ on the cross. Uh, Moshi. Yeah. So here's what I want to know. Um, is Okay, the doctrine of the Trinity, I believe, was fully formulated by the Council of Nicaea in the 3rd century. Um, that's quite a bit after the, um, the New Testament was formed. So, so like, what I'm curious is that if, let's say, that's someone... That's incorrect. That's uh, bad history. Mission. Okay, tell me, uh, tell me where I got it wrong. So, so... The Council of Nicaea did not formulate the doctrine of the Trinity. All uh, Moshi, Moshi, you got to mute when you're not speaking. We get tons of feedback from you. So right. all Christians from the New Testament times on affirmed the doctrine of the Trinity. They simply didn't have a name for it. The first person to come up with a name for it was, uh, oh my goodness. I think What's it was Tertullian. 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 Tertullian, thank you. Yes, Tertullian, my goodness. So Sounds Tertullian like coined the term Trinity. There's some other people that want to assign it to another guy, whatever. It doesn't matter. It was in the second century. Um, you know, and so he coined the term Trinity. But you can see in the writings of Justin Martyr, you can see in the writings of Clement, you can see in the writings of all of the church fathers that are not writing Bible passages that they are affirming the doctrine of the Trinity. They just don't have a theological name for it yet. So in the third century, what they were doing at the Council of Nicaea is that they were putting together a confession about not Trinitarianism, but a, a defense against Arianism. 
which is a totally different heresy. Um, and so in 325, when they had the Council of Nicaea, that council was not specifically about the Trinity. It was specifically about Arianism. And so and before um, that, we had the oh. two, two powers in heaven, right? In Second Temple Judaism, right? That's really important to say as well. Yeah, I mean, there's some argument for that. I wouldn't die on that hill. But yeah, so Moshi, what, what's, so did you, does that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know there was a lot of debate uh, on this topic in early Christianity. So, like, I mean, uh, Arian or Arius, um, he accepted all the 27 books of the New Testament, right? Well, so that's, it's a bit more complicated than that. So okay. there were some who rejected some and affirmed others. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit more messy than that. But that's, that's... I mean, I mean, as in, okay, so Arius himself, like, did, did he accept? He was the one that caused the whole controversy. Was, did he himself? Right, right. Don't know. He never wrote a canon list, so we don't know what books he accepted and what he didn't. And from, I haven't delved, delved deeply into his writings, maybe Marquis has, but um, I, I just couldn't tell you. Because there was a different opinions as to, there was about a core of 23 books that everybody accepted, and there were four that some people accepted and some people didn't. Um, and the error was, you know, the the the... the, the they were erring on the side of caution, so like they didn't include James, uh, J- um, James, Second John, Third John, and Revelation, and sometimes but, Jude. But those shouldn't have anything to do with whether you end up being a modalist or a trinitarian based on the presence or absence of those books. That would be <clears throat> irrelevant. Um, Correct. Yeah. You bet. You've had some time to think about uh, that uh, topic. Do you have any thoughts on what we were talking about? If you're speaking. Which topic? Uh, the one how we all essentially are guilty of murdering Christ. Um, I, I, I just have a hard time understanding how, how God would see us like all like, I don't know, equal to murderers or somewhere close to that level since we sinned when uh, like, I mean, that that's like that's like completely different. Like like I let's say I do a sin, like I should be equal to let's say Nicholas Cruz or whatever crazy murderer. Like it doesn't make really make sense. Nate, I have but, another but, way of putting this. I got another way of putting this. I was holding it in my pocket for because I figured there would be still some <laughs> disconnect. Go for it. Try to make it less oh. than three minutes. Yeah, it's gonna be less than one minute. Um, if you think about it as a spectrum, you're wrong. Okay, this is the wrong way to think about it. If you think about it as a binary choice, kind of in the same way that we said you either worship God or you worship the devil, it's a binary choice with God. There is holy and then there is not holy. It's not a matter of righteousness is over here on the right and unrighteousness is all the way over on the left and you're somewhere in between. No, our righteousness, the greatest thing we could ever do to God is filthy rags. And so if you think about it, from that perspective, there is holy, which is God, and then there is everything which is not God or antithetical to God or inconsistent with God, which is not less holy, it's not holy. So if God has a standard of holiness, even one sin, if, if I'll say it like this, if God has a standard of holiness and that's 100, let's make it a metric. God has a standard of holiness and it's not, and it's 100. Everything that's less than 100, even if it's 99.1009 after that decimal, all of that is less than 100. God is not seeing things as 99.9 is better than 98 or 98 is better than 3. He's seeing everything as less than 100. It's 100 and then less than 100. Everything is summarized as less than 100. And if you are less than 100, it does not matter. It is inconsequential where on that spectrum you are. If you're less than 100, you're worthy of death and eternal damnation. But, but Apostle, that's pretty silly, no? I mean, uh, like, (laughs) conceivably, God is more intelligent than any of us. And even if we can recognize a spectrum, like, me littering is different than me, like, raping and killing somebody, right? And we can recognize the gross difference between those things. And, And even if there is this being that 
uh, his vastness is so great that these things are inconsequential to him, he'd still have the intelligence to recognize the, the, the large difference morally between these two different things, right? And it, it, he might be able to say something like he still considers them both sin regardless, but to say that there isn't some kind of internal calculation that's made to say this person's worse or, you know, no, isn't they're, worse. They're just kind of Roland, but Roland, that's the Roland. conflation. Wait, wait, that's wait. Uh, Chris, I heard Chris. I heard Chris first. Yeah. Go okay, go, go ahead, Chris. So, 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 uh, please Roland. add me to the queue. Yeah, I'm, I'm also adding myself. Well, Christian Theology 101, <laughs> you know, this is not controversial. This is what Christians and Christian Theology has taught for 2000 years. Um, you may have a philosophical problem with it, but, you know, I mean, we're just telling you what Christianity teaches. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, I mean, you can use any kind of analogy you want. I mean, it's a light switch or it's a bridge, right? So, I mean, yeah, there, there's like the practical application, and then there's like the philosophical thing, right? Like, it's telling one little lie better or worse than murdering millions of people. Well, it's obviously not as bad as murdering millions of people. So, great. There's a giant chasm. God's on one side. You're on the other side with all the, all the uh, you know, all the other sinners, right? People who, like, chewed gum and talked in class. I don't know. Whatever you consider... Like telling a lie because someone looked fat in a dress and you lied and said they look good um, versus like you're right next to like the, the great evils of our time. Hitler, Pol Pot, Stalin. Well, great. Uh, Stalin takes one step and falls off because he can't make it because he's killed way, way tons of people. That person who has only told one lie, there's like a bridge that gets almost there, but they can't quite get there because it's still too far to cross. So, yeah, if you want to look at it that way, it's not as bad as someone who's killed, ma like done mass murder. But the practical application is they're all still in the same group. So they may be in a, a less bad position in that group, but for practical application, it doesn't matter because they are still in that group. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of like prison, right? It's not unlike prison. Some people serve prison sentences and, you know, for, for I don't know, perjury or lying. All they did is told a lie, and that lands them in a prison. And they're right there next to drug, drug dealers who have, you know, like peddled fentanyl and have death on their hands. And then they're next to people who have actual death on their hands and they eat people. Uh, yet they're all still part of the same group. Like, but I'm here for perjury. I'm not as bad as that guy. Nope. But you're still in the same place. Anyway. Um, yeah, so would I just but... – uh, Rolling quick and then good. I was just saying they have lesser sentences though, right? I mean it's not like the individual who's there for perjury is going to be there for as long as the cannibal. Well, sure. But all analogies break down and this is where it would be. So, I mean, you know, when we're not talking about humans and, you know, knee-jerk analogies um this is eternal i mean it's an eternal decision so make the right choice on this side of life and then it doesn't matter if you've told one lie or a hundred lies or what you've done you're eternally good um also good they, there's some we'll conflation that's uh, hang, some wait, 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 hang that was happening i'm, I'm gonna follow the queue uh, save it uh, uh, for a minute i'm gonna go down the queue there is good adult and then harold raises his hand and then we'll get to you and the son Good at all. Uh, I, yeah, I appreciate you, Nate. Uh, I'll try to be quick as possible. You had mentioned a good point that all analogies do break down after some time. So if you could help me understand where this one has broken down. This is back to my previous question that we kind of started to speak on. Um, just from that modalist perspective, I did a little bit of research on what a mode is. It's a way for which we experience something. Uh, Acts 4 and 8 states that then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders. So uh, here it is that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's experiencing God. Uh, in the spiritual um, context, obviously, yes, but then, of course, as you said moments ago, and we agreed upon that obviously God walked the earth uh, in the flesh, that which is a different experience. So Peter experienced God in the living, in the natural. He's experienced God um, through the spirit, which he was filled with. Uh, so could I, are those not two different modes, two different experiences for which Peter has then interacted with God? No. Well, yeah, again, that's not, the, that, that's not modalism, like a, a person can experience experience this modalism like modalism is specifically the doctrine that says god has modes so it's not about how people experience it like people don't experience modalism it would be it well, would be saying like you know you well, can't have you can't have the father son and holy spirit um all existing at the same time because they are the same person uh yeah. not three persons they are the same person so that means if you have the father existing you can't have the son and spirit if you have the holy spirit existing you can't have the father and son existing because well, well, it's like you can only be they could only be one of them at a time versus well, in well, hang on to make this point and and then i'm, I'm gonna get to the other people raise your hand but it, it would be like the john the baptist like how you have the father speaking this is my son who i'm well pleased and you have the holy spirit descending like a dove from heaven 
and you've got the physical body of Jesus existing, being baptized. So that's biblical citation that modalism is false because you see all three persons existing at the exact same time, and that would be contrary to modalism. Well, um, well, well modalism really kind of it oh, really kind of hang on, son. We get we get a cue. We got I think Harold, Apostle, and then you, uh, Harold. What's up, Harold? Hey, peace, y'all. Peace, peace, peace. I just got two little minuscule scriptures to bring out um, in reference to um, at least how I believe or how I understand sin. God weighs these things. Um, the first one is the book of Job, chapter 31, and specifically verse 6, just to give an idea. It says, let me be weighed in a even balance that God may know my integrity. Uh, so it seems to me here, and then I'll read verse 7. It says, if my step has turned out of the way and my heart has walked after my own eyes, and if any blot has cleaved to my hands, then let me sow and let another eat. Even more than this, let my offspring be rooted out. If my heart has been deceived, or no, excuse me, if my heart have been deceived by a woman, or if I had laid wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind unto another and let others bow down upon her. So this is an example how I would see that, yes, all sin is technically sin per se, quote unquote, uh, but these things are quite literally weighed in a balance. Um, that is why God is the righteous judge, simply because I'm going to probably have some background noise in a second, so I'm going to move. But that is why God is a judge. A judge doesn't just say, oh, you did wrong, you did wrong. Everybody gets equal punishment. It's just the idea of every man is is actually dealt with according to what it was that they did, whether it was that they littered, whether it was that they raped somebody, murdered, killed, lied, what have you. And this is my last scripture, Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 12. It says, if, now I'm going to read it in the NASB so we can all understand it. It reads, if you say, see, we did not know this. Does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it who keeps your soul and who and will he not render to man according to his own works? So, yeah, I think God definitely weighs these things in a balance. I don't I don't necessarily see all these things as equal um, because there are instances throughout the text, especially Genesis, where men of God did things that would be considered a sin, but God doesn't necessarily uh, reprove them or rebuke them, if you will. Why? Because they did certain things that were not necessarily ideal according to a rigid standard of morality, but because of the situational basis of why they did what they did, these things were not imputed to them as sin. That is why you have texts such as, blessed is the man who God does not impute sin unto nor iniquity. So, but on that, I'll you. Well, then Todd has a, well, Todd has a, uh, one sec, Chris. Uh, I mean, Todd and Chris in chat to address Todd because he's not speaking as, you know, says, you know, be perfect for I'm perfect. God. Um, so I, I, I don't know why, but we're still having trouble getting everyone on the same page. And it's not like you, you have to believe this stuff. You should, but you can still disagree. But you should at least, I, I, I don't know why we can't all understand it the same way that Christianity, you know, kind of 101 teaches it and has taught it for thousands of years that it doesn't matter about if someone is getting judged a little bit less or a little bit harsher because of the amount or severity of the sin. The fact is, without Christ, that's like that's the key, right? And, and Moshi in chat, you wrote something like, "God has does God uh, so God has an unreasonable expectation of humanity." No, the expectation of humanity is to repent 
uh, follow Christ, be born again, and then you never have to think about, am I being judged for two sins or three sins? It doesn't matter. You've been judged righteous because of Jesus. That's the expectation God has. And if you do that, then good job. Um, if you don't do that, then you have a problem. So it's not it's not the sin. It's the not doing the obvious, which is following Christ. Uh, Chris, it sounded like you were I gotta say something. I know I know Marquise is rating than Sun, but it's what you had to say quick. I'm just saying, like, you know, blessed is the man whose sins are not imputed to him. That's talking about salvation by faith alone. It's not talking about God winking at our sin based on the situation. That's just called situational ethics. That's one hundred percent not how the Bible describes sin. Uh Marquise and then Sun. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the issue is, Nate, because of our postmodern context, we have ingested a lot more of secular humanism than we maybe would think. And secular humanism basically tries to rationalize or measure the justice of God or the righteousness of God by human standards, which is backwards because we get our human standards of righteousness and justice from God's morality, right? So we're using a borrowed metric to measure the standard. That just doesn't work. It ends up being circular in, in, in reasoning. Um, and the original question, the, 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 this is what I wanted to point out, there's conflation happening because the original question was about um, how God, how, how the grace of God can be considered righteous. And it's, so, so if you think about righteousness, righteousness is not about you know, if, we, if we're confining it to, oh, each person gets what they deserve or don't deserve, but righteousness is simply and generally that things are balanced and fair and that sin or bad things get punished. How, when, and why they get punished is up to a judge. That they get punished is what is fair, right? So it doesn't matter that Jesus, uh, Jesus taking the sin of the world, and then God, as as Christ, uh, as Chris said, not Christ, <laughs> as Chris <laughs> said, pouring out the justice of God onto Jesus. It's easy, it's easy to confuse us, Marquis. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> There's a fire guy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> right. Um, but the point being, the fact that Jesus takes the punishment of sin means sin gets punished. Right. It doesn't matter where. It doesn't matter. You know what? It, what these these other nuances. The fact is sin gets punished, so God is righteous, right? Because his righteousness, his justice is about the fact that there was a consequence for this action. And to build on your analogy, Nate, the, the, the last one I wanted to say, right? If we put all sin and all sinners by association on the same continent, right? There's like a you, – you talked about this plateau and the chasm. Like Australia. Right. So – all the sinners are on Australia. Australia is sinking into the ocean, surrounded by lava. Everybody's going to die, right? And then God is, you know, somewhere on a different piece of land, and everywhere else is sinking, and that land is like salvation. It's totally solid. He's going to build a bridge. That bridge is Christ to this failing continent. It doesn't matter if you are right there on the edge where the bridge is being built, or if you're way in the back or in the middle of the continent, you still got to cross the bridge because the whole continent is seeking, right? So when we talk about guilt, because that's the difference, we're talking about the differences in sin, but then we're saying that because sin is different by virtue of how it affects people, that somehow makes you more or less guilty. It doesn't. Guilt is a binary situation. You are guilty or you are innocent. If you're innocent, you're not guilty. If you're guilty, you're not innocent. It's like the final verdict in the, uh, you know, in the courtroom. And so if you are guilty, you're on this continent. There's only one way to get off. And it doesn't matter if you're one mile away from the bridge or 20 miles away from the bridge to get off. You still have to cross the bridge. And if God doesn't extend that bridge to the continent, no one gets saved. And so if then we don't we understand can't that say, at this oh, point, then there's no yes. hope. <laughs> so, and that's the point, Nate. We're like nuancing, oh, well, I only had to walk two miles to the bridge, so that makes me a little bit better. No, you still needed salvation as much as the person who's 20 miles back. It doesn't matter. You're both damned, and you both need the salvation. If God doesn't put the bridge over to save you who's two inches away from it when it comes over onto the, the, the sin continent, if he doesn't put that over for you, 
he doesn't put it over for the other person. If he doesn't put it for the other person, you don't get it either. It's binary. And that's what the Bible supports. Take it or leave it. Uh, Yvette, it was son's turn, but you, you didn't answer the last time I called on you. So I guess that's fine. Uh, what were you trying to say, Yvette? Yeah, because I, I was looking. Where did I put my phone? Um, yes, um, I. Uh, so things are black and white when it comes to sin and being righteous. From what I understand, because uh, God did make a big deal. What Apostle was saying reminded me of how God made a big deal with uh, Adam and Eve when they sinned. Like they just grabbed an apple that they were the forbidden fruit that they weren't supposed to eat, and then they died because of it. Like they deserved death. So I believe what Apostle is saying, like, we, it doesn't matter what sin, and you, Nate, of course, and Chris said the same thing, that it doesn't matter what sin uh, you commit, like, we all deserve death. And 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 that, that explains why, because my next question was going to be, um, uh, why does love, God love unconditionally? Because that's not righteous, but that answered my question, <laughs> which is, that is why God loves us unconditionally, because without conditions right so because uh we we like it, it, things are black and white when it comes to sin like you're either holy because you've always been holy or righteous because you've always been righteous and of course we're imputed righteous with with Christ living in us uh son sorry it took so long to get to you what's up now nah, we're good bro more grace everybody more grace uh there's some there's uh and Nate, uh, it pertains to modalism. I, I think there's been a lot of mis, uh, misinterpret things about modalism. I'm not a modalist, I don't think. Uh, but however, I do believe in uh, modes is just, a, to me, it's a harsher word uh, to explain God more so than manifestation, which I, it's, which I do believe that's what modalism ultimately capture, captivates, the manifestations of who God is. And uh, I have a problem. The reason that I say I have a problem is because, well, according to Ephesians 4 and 5, right, it's clear cut in this scripture. It says that, I'm going to go to it really quickly. It shouldn't take, should take long, long. 4 and 5, I'm here right now. And it says, well, I'm going to start at verse 4. Right. And this is ultimately about the unity of the spirit or the unity of the believers in Christ. Right. It says there is one body. And one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, that's very uh, strategically scripture. That's, that's very strategically recorded to me in the scriptures because uh, Trinitarians hold the belief that the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. And this would clearly be in contradiction with not only this scripture, you simply, yeah. you simply don't understand how to read it, and that's okay. It's whoa, 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 well, no, well, 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 Nate, I, honestly, it wasn't that I didn't, uh, I didn't understand from the Trinitarian's point of view. I completely understood that. I like, I was just saying, I don't understand why it would be considered as a sound doctrine, right? So, so tell if, me, son, go ahead and tell me what the Trinitarian point of view on Ephesians 4, 4 through 7 would be. Well, well, with all due respect, Chris, I'm not going to tell you anything unless I can finish my point, bro. Like, that's just respect. You were going to keep gish galloping and going on. We stopped you at one point. So we said Ephesians 4 4, uh, 4 through 7 teaches uh, Unitarianism or modalism. So please tell me 
what the Trinitarian view of these verses is. Go ahead. If you truly understand the Trinitarian position, then you should have no problem elucidating to us what that position is. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I like I said uh, once previously before, uh, yeah, I would find that to be unfair seeing that you cut me off in the middle of me making my statement and my points. Okay, right. Leave it, so leave long. Long. Yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm not, I'm not finna do that. We do know that the Trinitarian, we do know that you right, guys so believe you that the Holy Spirit. Know. Yo, 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 listen, how, how are, how are you a believer and can't express the patience of the spirit? I'm having patience with you. I'm not cutting me off like that, bro. Listen, you can cry about the meta all you like, like a Hebrew Israelite, but it's not going to, it's not going to help you. What I'm trying to get you to do is focus, and I'm trying to get you to tell me what the Trinitarian position on Ephesians 4, 4 through 7 is. Either you know it or you don't, and you can go on for the next 10 minutes and cry about the meta, how I'm cutting you off, but you need to answer the question. Like I said, bro, you're not trying to get me to do anything. Okay, so I have a proposition. In order to put this to bed, good Lord, let's just assume, Chris, that son has a master's in divinity and is a theological whiz and knows better than anyone what the Trinitarian view is. He just doesn't want to say it because you keep cutting him off. But for the listeners who are like, I wish someone would just answer the question, uh, Chris, could you please just explain the Trinitarian point of view um, with the understanding that son has a better understanding than you. He just doesn't want to say it because you interrupt him. Um, so could you please, Chris, give us quickly before we move on. Uh, the Trinitarian understanding of those verses for everyone in the audience who would actually like to know. And then sure. we'll move on. So so the, the Christian, I'm not going to say Trinitarian, I'm going to say the Christian view. The Christian view of these verses is that this is talking about the essence of God. Okay, um, This is a statement about the unity of uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and their role in salvation if you look um, in the context of Ephesians chapter 4. And so this is talking about the essence and how God is one essence. Um, this is not making a comment on the persons of the Trinity. It is simply making a comment about God in general um, in terms of his essence. And so this is something that modalists love to pick on, and they're very silly about it. Um, they don't have an answer to the question, so that's the problem. Uh, okay. Son, would you like to go ahead and continue where you were going and uh, try to do it quickly because we've also got someone else to get to that just joined us. So go ahead, son. All right. Uh, and pertains to the essence. I don't have a problem with that. We clearly know that God is. A, we clearly know that God is spirit. Whether we're referring to Him as Jesus Christ, who was the Word, that spirit. Whether we're referring to Him as the Father, who was God, His spirit or whether referring to him as the Holy Spirit, which is also spirit, obviously. So to me, it clearly explains in this scripture that I just read that they are one spirit. Now, I understand the distinctions that's made between in the, in the Trinitarian doctrine and concerns of the personhood or the Godhead. But however... This brought my other point up, which was in Galatians 4 and 6. And in Galatians 4 and 6, and we can all have tested this since we're all believers, that it says, and because ye are sons, only the sons of God are led, The only those who have the spirit of God are led by the sons of God, which is, we just read in uh, Ephesians 4 and 5, that's one spirit, have sent forth the spirit of his son, and to your hearts crying, Abba, Father. Now, here's the problem of the personification that I have with the Trinitarian doctrine. Wait, this doesn't sound like it's going to be quick. We agreed it would be okay. quick, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm finna land it right. I'm, 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 I'm pretty much finna land it right here, right now. Basically, what I was saying is, why do you guys still hold to the Holy Spirit being a completely different person? When here, in this text in Galatians 4 and 6, it says that the Spirit of the Son has been sent forth, and we do know the Father sent the Spirit, and 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 to your hearts, crying, "Abba, Father." The okay. Spirit, of, the Spirit of the Son is valid is validated as the Holy Spirit here in this text, and so it's also answer, validated. It's also yeah. validated as the Son. 
Yeah, so the answer is in the first page of Genesis. Like, the Father is saying, let us make man in our image, while it specifically says the location of the Spirit is on the face of the deep. So two different persons, two different places, uh, first page of the Bible. Uh, Brian, what's up, Brian? How are you? Yeah, that didn't answer my question, though. But you don't answer our questions, so we're not going to have a dialogue with you. Brian, what's up, Brian? Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, grace and peace to you. Um, you guys are having a great conversation, man. I like to, you know, implement uh, my two cents. Go ahead. So, yeah, I used to be a Trinitarian myself, and I kind of merge, if it makes sense, uh, the oneness and Trinitarian view to a certain degree. And... um but I don't hold fully due to the fact that, you know, the distinct persons part is where I have a problem. I don't think that uh, specific area can hold scrutiny. Uh, okay, why? Well, I gave yeah. one reason. <laughs> Yeah, so so basically, uh, when you say distinct persons, right, that, you know, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so the Son and the Holy Spirit are operating, and, you know, you hold this theological view that because they have a will and a mind and emotions, that they're a quote-unquote person, but if these whoa, 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 whoa. will and... No, 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 hold up. Yo, why do you keep it's cutting people off, bro? Hey, Nate, like, can you moderate because Chris, bro? He's like, like, he's this like, this is son. Shut up. We're having a conversation. Mike, he means that with the love of Christ. I will say Seriously. that when someone says a point that is so false in our understanding, that point deserves stopping to talk about it. That's that's the answer. Sure, Chris said, could have said it nicer, but I, I just son, you you do. Thing. I just want to say one did thing. Did you did you want to interrupt okay, me to do it? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Hold on, Jin Sun. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, that's the point. So, if someone's like, hey, we're all believers, and you know, Jesus is Satan, and then they just try to nonchalantly move on, we're going to stop them because that is so wildly not what we're all agreeing to. So, that's the answer. So, that's the answer. Uh, Jin, hang on just a second. Um, Brian, what was the thing that you just said that had Chris stop you? And let's talk about that. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. No problem. So, um, <clears throat> so basically what I said was, um, the, there's a Trinitarian perspective or part of the Trinitarian perspective where, uh, because Christ and the Holy spirit has a will, a mind and emotions, it's deemed to be this quote unquote, uh, distinct person from the father. Okay. And then right. Chris so stopped you to say, Go ahead, Chris. Right. And Jen, go ahead if you had a quick point, and then I'll... I'll yeah, very, very, very quickly. And uh, basically, when somebody's asking a question to uh, someone else, it means that that person doesn't know the answer. So it has to have the respect towards the person who is asking the question. If he doesn't have the respect, then it's, it's not the person is not really willing to learn. He's just willing to impose his own view. So then there's, like, no genuine learning to, you know, to be done. That's Agreed. it. Uh, Chris. So, so what I was going to say is, um, sir, like, uh, Brian, that is not what Trinitarian theology teaches at all. God has one mind. He has one will. There are not three separate minds and three separate wills. That is not Christian teaching. So I don't know where you got that idea. I don't know who told you that, but in the last 2,000 years, there have been exactly zero people who are Christians who teach what you just said. Zero. So do you agree that Tertullian is the first one to publicate the Acts? Because Trinity is not in the Bible, right? Right, so, so Tertullian, Tertullian coined the phrase, but they were still working out some of the details in terms of how to describe the Trinity, but all Christians, starting with the, the, the apostles and, you know, the, the folks that followed the apostles, all Christians affirmed and believed in the Trinity. They just didn't have a word for it. 
And so my question to you would be, since you actually don't understand the Trinity, um, as because you just elucidated a, a, a non-Christian view, you elucidated a, um, uh, a what's called partialism, or you would also be part uh, polytheism. So you just you just elucidated a polytheistic view of the Trinity that no Christians hold. So my question would be, what is the definition of a person? Do you know classically what the definition of a person is? Uh, yeah, I could give a pretty good uh, guesstimation off the top, you know, um, without, I guess, looking it up or whatever. But, um, you know, I understand a person is to uh, pretty much be a uh, an individual, a human being. No, that's not even remotely close to the definition of a person. Uh, you're a little hard to hear, Chris, but yes, oh, what sorry, is a is person better? and a woman? Yes. If anyone wants to Google the attributes of personhood, they are easily available from a scholarly source. Um, look right. at any medical journal. You can find the five to six attributes of personhood. They're going to be awareness, self-awareness, autonomy, agency. Um, it's going to be communication, moral agency, intellect, and reciprocation or reciprocity. Those are the six attributes that constitute personhood. You need all six. You can't have five, four, three, two, or one. You need all six in order to be considered a person. That is widely understood for the last, I don't know how many centuries, that a person is not about mind, will, and emotions. A person is about those six attributes. Can, can somebody can somebody uh, pull up the definite? Because he didn't say personhood. He said person. So we understand the distinction between personhood and person. But if we look up the definitions for both, they are not the same. Okay, so, so we're not looking up definitions in dictionaries, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to go to a theological source, and this one's real easy. I can post it in the chat. Um, the definition of a person is laid out by Boethius in the 6th century, okay? Boethius laid out the classical definition of person and personhood as pertains to God, not to individual humans, okay? And personhood is defined as the individual substance of a rational nature. Have you ever heard that definition given before, Brian? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That, that's that's no problem. But okay, again, so can you tell me what that uh, means? Can you tell me what the individual words mean? The individual substance of a rational nature. Can you describe well, in detail each of those and how they pertain to person? Well, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't argue that. My my thing would be explain the Holy Spirit as a personhood. That's 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 what I would want to know. Right. We wouldn't say it as a personhood. We would say he has personhood. Personhood is an attribute. Person is the noun. He's a person, right? So, so the Holy Spirit is a person in the definition I just gave you. And what you're attempting to say is that, look, I, I was a Christian. I am now a modalist or whatever other stripe um, because I reject the idea of personhood. But yet you don't know the definition of personhood to start with and my my well my uh, i guess my uh, my inst my hope for you is that you would investigate this a little further if you would like to know more about personhood and why it's important and why the holy spirit is a person and why the son is a person and why the father is a person um well, well know, that's that's Aquinas fan, but Aquinas describes this perfectly in his Doctrine of God in Summa Theologica, chapter 29. So well, yeah, yeah, that, that's... Link, I will post a link to Aquinas.cc, chapter 29. When you pull it up on your phone, it's going to be in Latin, but you swipe it to the right, and it'll give you the English translation, and then you can read up on why God is three persons. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no problem. I appreciate that, man. Um, my thing is, if I may interject, uh, just so basically what I'm saying, I don't want us to talk past each other or you know misunderstand. Um, I don't personally feel like you can come from a trinitarian worldview and try to explain the metaphysical nature of the Holy Spirit and how God is functioning in these aspects. You know, that's the problem 
with the quote unquote person and personhood because it's not a person, you know, um, yeah, maybe it has attributes like a quote unquote person, but you know, it's, 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 it's far too incomprehensible for you to understand or try to confine within a certain theological view. Right. But it's not because the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is a person. It no, that. it doesn't. Person is not it's in the Bible. I don't understand why. Okay. It's, it just sounds real choppy and very, very quiet. Did you get a new headset or something? Uh, no, no sir. Or... So, so is this better? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was the car that was interfering with it. Okay, so so Brian, what I'm going to do, I'm going to post Aquinas.cc chapter 29. This is in plain English. Um, you know, your contention. I guess you're a binatarian. Is that the deal? Uh, no, sir. I don't. Or I don't even like. Phone list. Well, this is the thing. Even with the 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 tax, taxonomy of trying to categorize people's you know worldview, I think that that's also part of the problem. You know, these titles of oneness and modalists and all of these things doesn't yeah, necessarily... because we've been doing this for 2,000 years and we've seen well, every, every version of this and we know exactly how to categorize it and we know the problems with it theologically. Well, that's that's kind of that's kind of incorrect because now you have to deal with the fact that you have Oriental Orthodox Christianity and you have Eastern Orthodox Christianity and, you know, I'm very familiar yeah. with, you know, these two things and what happened oh, really? throughout the years. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, Can I you tell me I the st- definition of theosis? Theosis, that's um, pertaining to God, right? Um, Because theology is the study of God, right? Um, So the base doctrine of Eastern Orthodoxy, like the main thing that they teach is theosis. Like it's like the number one thing. So if you're telling me you know all about Eastern Orthodoxy and you don't know. Well, I I, I didn't say. Yeah, that's not what I said. Yeah. So, so again, let me repeat myself so you can understand clearly. I study the Eastern Orthodox Church Fathers and the Oriental and Rome uh, Church Fathers or the Romanized Hellenistic uh, Church Fathers so like of Rome. Be? Like Maximus uh, the Confessor, we're talking about Irenaeus, or we're talking about yes, Augustine. all of those guys. Yeah, yeah, because you got Yared, you got um, Severus of Antioch, you have uh, a lot of church fathers that came from the Ethiopian Nubian area that were kind of rejected during the Council of Chalcedon, I believe, and. Um, they didn't want to accept the hypostatic union, this thing that you're trying to explain now. So, right. you know, I think that but there's yeah, only right. a small sliver of, or, of Oriental Orthodox and actually the Eastern Orthodox Church does hold to Chalcedon. So only the Oriental Orthodox reject Chalcedon. Right. Okay. So why why so, would they not be accepted? Because they didn't want to. Because I mean, they're heretics, they, because they refused to understand the true nature of Christ. And they substituted what? a false Christ. Period. Yeah. See, I, I don't. Yeah, but see, that's who, who, who has the power to make that decision, though. That's the Bible. The thing. So when you go, okay, can you show? Can you show me the hypostatic union in the Bible? Absolutely. You got a three hours. Philippians two, Philippians two, five through eight. You're gonna find it there. Also, Nick, I put a, um, I put a link in the chat. You got a lot of background noise. Our personhood. Yeah. Link in the chat to person. That's all I want to say. So, so let's let's deal with Philippians two five and six. Let's because let, I like that. I like that you pulled that up. Um, can we deal with that right now? Really, because it won't take long. I'm heading now. I you want to yeah, yeah, I, I actually go. I actually have to go to a client real quick, and I'll be back in like twenty minutes. But. I mean, okay. here's, the, here's the bottom line, man, is like for 2000 years, it has been extremely clear what Christian doctrine is. If you reject Christian doctrine, the the essentials of the historic Christian faith, hypostatic union, the, the person and nature of Christ, if you reject uh, the Trinity, if you reject the virgin birth, if you reject the second coming, if you reject any of these things, by definition, you are not Christian, you are something else. Okay. And so Man, that's, this that's idea, good. 
Yeah, that's yeah. that's your opinion, though. So I no, mean, that's like, not that's my that, opinion. That is, that's why that I would. Is what the Bible teaches. This is well, their, 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 the their, hypostatic their, union is not in the Bible. So it I is mean, in the Bible, can't. sir. The problem yeah. is, is that you simply have either listened to some retard online that wow, has that given was, you that bad was good, that was very Christ-like, um, or yeah, of course. So, or you have misread something in the church fathers, which I doubt that you've read any of those. Right. Um, I mean, if you don't even know what theosis is and you claim to, to have read Maximus the Confessor, then we got problems. So um, that, that, that means absolutely nothing in this conversation. All right, that's that's well, like what it is, is what I'm trying to get so, at, sir, is like you're trying to give us all of these ideas that you think that you have that are scholarly. And what I'm trying to so push can back I, can on I, can is I ask that you a question, sir? you don't actually you know what you're talking about. OK, do you know the metaphoric nature of the Trinity that you guys call the Trinity? Can you explain the details of the functionality of how God operates in these three, quote unquote, persons? Sure. He is co-equal, co-eternal, consubstantial. Um, he has one essence, three in persons. He has one See what mind, I'm saying? one persons. will. He's not three persons. Right. Yeah, okay. well, that's, but that's, you, again, that's you're, ridiculous. You are, yeah, because again, you don't even know what a person is. Well, you I, well you obviously you don't either. Boethius if you're is. saying God is operating in three persons, like, I mean, that's yeah. that's crazy. So that that's is, retarded okay. to say that so, my father that's not very the God of all like God. Right, 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 right. I mean, yeah. Look, I mean, dude, you can come up here and try to teach nonsense theology. I, brother, I'm not trying to teach anything. I just, you know, want to understand the whole person, quote unquote, because that, you know, no, I think you my, my you just my rejected heavenly... all the stuff I gave you to read. You refuse to read it. You don't, you well, don't you... actually want to know or understand anything. You want to come up here and argue. Well, I mean, you asked me about the Can I add something, Nate? Yeah, sure, that... Jen. What's up, Jen? Can I add something? Sure. Yo, Brian, uh, before we go into this, like, just shouting and talking continuously, what is your intent, bro? Do you believe you that God... Ways. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get there. Do, do you... Are, are you having, like, this uh, love of God, patience, you know, the, the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? Remember that, Brian? Please, man. Absolutely. Just absolutely, absolutely, sir. I mean, but because I don't agree with your quote unquote doctrine, doesn't mean I don't have, you know, or possess the fruits of the spirit. Let's be clear. Yeah, even atheists have the Holy Spirit of Christ. That you need to repent. Oh, you're chopping up again, Chris. See, you see the, the the Most High. He doesn't. He doesn't like that. Wait, 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 wait a bit, uh, Chris. Well, right. So. Uh, you're gonna acknowledge that you're a Hebrew Israelite, right? Absolutely not. But do you guys accept all humanity in the plan of salvation of God, or just certain people? You said you guys. What are you? I don't understand. You? Who is you guys? I'm a Christian. What are you talking about? No, I asked if you were like a Hebrew Israelite, and you said yes. I said absolutely not. Or you're not, you're a Christian. Absolutely. Well, then you have to believe in the Trinity, man. You have to understand that if you really want no. to understand an intellectual level. Well, did you not hear me in the beginning? Yes, but you have to have like, you know, this like uh, calmness and patience. If we're going to start fighting here, we're not showing a good example, bro. That's not a good example to the world. To whoever is listening to us here in public. Right, right. So I'm fighting you right now. I mean, I don't. No, but like you and Chris were, f like, I mean, sounds like fighting. You know, just, just, you know. So like, why, aren't, uh, why aren't you addressing him too then? No, the thing is that like in the early church, there were like these kind of fightings, but we have to resolve them in love, bro. Like if we have no love and we have all the spiritual gifts, we are nothing. You remember Saint Paul saying that? Of course, absolutely. Yeah. So, are you gonna are you gonna talk to him now? Because I mean, You're I wasn't fighting about. I, was, I wasn't. But it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not us versus you, bro. You don't understand that. It's like we are one in the one body of Christ. We're Amen. Not Amen. Against each other, man. That, that's what I want you to understand. We're not against each other. I, I hope agree. You understand that. Yes, and sir. And that's what yes, the sir. devil does, man. Is just separating us. The devil Amen. Needs to divide. 
I, so, I agree. Uh, please understand that Chris is just a bit excited, like you are. <laughs> That's human nature, but let's use uh, theology in the right way, you know? I don't know if we can call that excitement, you know, but okay, I, I'll take your word for it. No, I'm, I'm, look, I'm not a native English speaker, so I'm... But, uh, so, Todd, you, you got fight. anything? Let's see. Chris is busy. Oh, Todd, if you are speaking, we don't hear you. I see your mute button's gone, but we don't hear you if you are trying to speak. So, I don't know. Have we solved everything? Are we done? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was trying to pacify uh, Brian in the sense, Brian, don't, don't take don't take it wrong. In the sense of like, uh, let's remove the personal. Uh, how can I say it? Nate, help me here a bit. The personal flesh in the way, but uh, spread the message of Christ, which is uniting, right? I mean, oh, Christians yes, should be all united, right? We shouldn't fight each other. You know, we are a joke in the world, right? Right now we are a joke. Well, well, We're divided is. because we have all this, you know, like uh, mental diversities. And I understand this is important. But, you know, like there's like certain uh, philosophical things which are like a bit uh, too much. And the, the, the common person is not going to understand it anyway, right? And we keep dividing ourselves. And then the world, right, the, the, the Satanist, the whoever is there, is taking advantage of us and keeps separating us and even humanity. And then we're just overwhelmed by the enemy, Right. Yes, sir. I mean, that sounds really great. And I agree with you. But again, you know, uh, the, the the brother that I was just speaking with, it comes off a little condescending, you know, in his uh, explanation or whatever. And, you know, throwing out a bunch of big words as if he's like, you know, smarter than I am, you know, asking me, do I know the definition of things that have absolutely nothing to do with what I'm asking him? I mean, like, why aren't you addressing that as well? Because the Bible says to make it plain in your quote unquote teaching, right? Look, dude, here's the thing. You came in here swinging about how the Trinity isn't true, you know, that you used to believe in the Trinity, etc. And then you don't even understand the base issues surrounding the Trinity or any of the definitions that to the discussion. So that's that so, yeah. we were talking, getting at. Yeah, see, now that's, that's the problem. See, your perception is not reality because I didn't come in swinging. I came in very polite, greeted you guys, and asked you, why do you feel like they're persons, right? And then, you first of all, when I presented it, you said, that's wrong. The Trinity is not about person or personhood no and i didn't then, say that you're misrepresenting me what you said okay was that 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 each person in the trinity in the trinitarian doctrine has a different mind and a different will and that's where we stop that's, yes because that's a I, misunderstanding of the trinity you were completely dead wrong about that do you admit right. that you were dead wrong about that well show me how i was wrong how, how are they persons explain that to me how no, is no, christ no. and the holy that's spirit not, a person? that was not the argument that the was the argument. argument. The, no, no, no. The argument you made that we stopped you at was, again, let's see if you can repeat it, that you said that the Trinitarian teaching is that God has three minds and three wills. I, I did not, not say that. You did say it. I you did, can go back I and did not replay and say it. Yeah, yeah, please do, because I definitely didn't say that. You said three minds? I definitely did not say Trinitarian that. Trinitarian version of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is they each have a mind and a will. And oh what, my I said, God. what I said was, I said, I stopped you. Nate, did I not stop him and say, wait a minute, that's not It was true. He was asking about, he was asking about the verse uh, where, where, I forgot what it was. Was it Ephesians or was that the other guy? But he was asking about a verse that talked about and said, see, how can they be different? Uh, they'd have to have like different wills or something like that. And that's where it all stopped. Well, when, when, can can you uh, the replay right? Um, when yep, you guys go back, 
yeah, when you go back, you're going to you're going to clearly hear me say that the, how does the father. Right. So so the father is the, the, the essence of the Trinity. And I said that the son and the Holy Spirit, according to the Trinitarian worldview, those two is what I said. You guys say they are persons because they have a mind, a will and emotions. Right. That's what I said. I didn't say three minds. Right. And that's well, OK, that's just that's splitting hairs. When you say that they each have a mind, will and emotions, that means that there are three minds, wills and emotions. How else would we take that? Are you, would are we you, take are that you as listening? one will and one mind? Yes, I'm, so listening. That's what I'm listening to the that's actual it. words coming out of your mouth. I, and you're okay, trying so to say that they mean something that they don't, and you're gaslighting. Well, well, let me let me say it again, brother. I'm not I'm not trying to, you know, fight with you or anything. So this is what I'm saying. I understood the Trinitarian worldview to define the personhood, quote unquote, of the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christos, right? I understand that to be the personhood is explained because of the will, the mind and emotions of That's Christ. Yes. So so right. that's what I said. That is what I corrected you on is that is not okay. the Trinitarian teaching. Okay, okay, okay. So please explain to me how they are a personhood, if you don't mind. I can just say one thing to Brian. It's not that important theologically, so I'm sorry, guys. Right, knock yourself out. You know, Brian, you said Jesus Christos? Yes. That's Romanian for Jesus Christ, man. Thank you. I know, I know. I know. Go ahead, though. No, no, no. Uh, let the guys go back to the topic on the Trinity. Okay. I mean, I've already explained how the, what persons oh, okay. are an individual right. substance of a rational nature. And you said, yes, I've make read it, make that. It, I make understand it, make that. It, make, it, make it plain for the people who, who don't know what that is, brother. Sure. If so you don't individual, mind. An individual substance, that just means that they're that each of the persons is an individual substance or subsistence, okay? What that okay. means, okay, of a rational nature, it means that they are all rational, they, they share a mind, and that ah, they, have, exactly. they have the same nature. So there is one mind in God, there is one will in God, and each of the persons are an individual subsistence of that will and mind. That is what it so, means. So I was correct when I said that the <laughs> personhood. The, well, well, let me let me finish. Let me finish. So you're saying in a very sophisticated way that the personhood of the Holy Spirit and Yeshua, right, is because of they that because they function with the mind, even though it's the mind of God. I agree with you. But because they have a mind, that's why it's a quote unquote personhood, right? Am I understanding correctly? Uh, Chris, can I say one thing? Go ahead. So, Brian, we, we have to understand the Christian philosophy. Before engaging into these topics, we have to read the books of these church fathers and so on, like Christ, Chris uh, mentioned before. Otherwise, we're just going to give our opinion on things which we don't fully understand, bro. So it's really important to read. And trust me, I, I, I promise you, if you're going to read these writings Chris is mentioning, it's going to be very enlightening. I promise you that. But if we don't do the right, the, the reading and we just give our opinion, you know, when what we saw on the YouTube or Internet, we're not going to have a full comprehension of the whole story. So you should be like, you know, like, uh, if you think Chris is being nasty to you, you should be forgiving to him because he's your brother in Christ, you know. And engage more into reading, bro. Reading is very important <laughs> before engaging into, you know, this super complex topics. Wow. Okay. Well, you guys have a blessed day. Take care. Uh, Michael. Hello. Greetings and salutations. What's going Likewise. on today? Oh, a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> a bunch of nonsense? Uh, Go figure, a bunch of nonsense. 
I'm waiting outside in the hot, hot heat for a client to come that said that they would be here. I can see the guys in the kitchen in this restaurant. I'm pounding on the door, <laughs> and no one is answering the door. And I can see, like, ten guys back there, and literally nobody is coming up here to get the door. Go Fantastic. Is there a breaker in the side? <laughs> well, we'll wait with you, buddy. Speaking of hot, hot, it's almost uh, – it's well. It's only quarter to 10 and it's almost 80 degrees here. It is 83 here. It is lay hot here. <laughs> you guys talking in Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? For us, like 20... in Europe. <laughs> well, no, I'm in Canada. I, I always, I always translate it because, you know, no, but no one, you know, the, the Americans haven't figured out that, you know, the entire world outside of them uses the uh, metric system. So it's 23 degrees. Well, it's, yeah, it's quite good. It's better than England. And yeah. England have, I think, uh, 15 now. Something the like world, that. The world hasn't figured out that America has the dollar and that they should be following us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'll have it much longer. <laughs> what's the topic? You know, is? Oh, you, well, you know what's... Whatever what's you want it to be. Yeah, I'm, Michael. I'm curious. I'm curious as to this. So, I'm hearing all this stuff, and and it's I find it very, very funny. So, I've heard many people on the right say that you know that you know that Joe Biden is you know cognitively impaired, and I mean basically has to have people feed him and everything else like that. What I find really interesting is that he is he is somehow both cognitively impaired and unable to feed himself, and a criminal mastermind that has hidden all of his crimes um, in government for 50 years. And I find, and I'm curious as to what you think about that. I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed by these things. Uh, who's well, that? Oh, we'll try, so hidden? well, super uh, easy. Go ahead, Chris. He hasn't hidden his crimes. No one cares. He could go out on fifth Avenue and slit people's throats. And the press would be like, wow, those people really had it coming. Joe did a great job slitting all those people's throats. <laughs> that's the deal. Yeah. I that's mean, the like, answer. like the crimes are not hidden. Just no one's going to do anything the, about it because they're right, all part of the, the crimes same are not system. Hidden. Yeah, he's not a criminal mastermind. He doesn't even know what flavored pudding he's eating. These crimes all happened while he was vice president for the most part. Um, you know, and it, it's just, you know, yeah, he's drooling in his drool. And how long till the people are going to wake up to the true Christianity? Um, yeah, it's going to be. That's an oxymoron. Well, Stanley, do you have anything to say <laughs> about anything? Yeah, I don't do oyster? politics. All right. Yeah, do you have a religious topic? Pol- yeah, um, I see you have an atheist on the panel. Uh, you guys should see my debate against Michael the Canadian. Uh, Wait, atheist. aren't you an atheist? No. Oh, is this? Oh, is this? Sta- yeah, uh, guys, this is uh, this is um, this is Stanley Terry. Um, M- Mr. He, yeah, and uh, he's. He's a he's a different level of delusional, um, but but yeah. but I'll let I'll let him all ex- claims I'll all claims ex- I'll let ex- no, him explain it to you. Go ahead. This will yeah be, this yeah will be no it's all, it's all claims it's all claims but no no substantiation. You know I I, I would uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave a, a link of my debate against Mr. Michael here and it was very refreshing, um, very delicious because uh, could he, you um, I guess could you summarize like what he thinks the craziest thing you said is or, or are you saying the delusion is that he's he says no, he he's like, uh, one, one or something and and you dispute that or is it like the claim he makes like you know the earth is flat or, or no like, no uh, I, for, for you as it relates to me supposedly being delusional you would have to ask him because i don't know what he's talking about but uh, what I do know, what Stanley, I do know, share the, uh, share the uh, seven days, educate all the Christians on the seven days. No, no, be, no, 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 no. Before we do uh, any of that, uh, I just want to make it clear. We had a debate and uh, my friend, uh, it was embarrassing for you. And, was it and, and I mean, uh, it was civil on my part, uh, but it was embarrassing in, in virtue of the fact that he was making claims and none of the claims uh, he was making, he could substantiate once. I exposed his ignorance about the Hebrew scriptures. So he he likes to go to the um, 
sort of popular verses, which uh, seem to be problematic for those who uh, profess to be Christians. But uh, once he has one who is educated on the topic, all of a sudden he loses all of his courage and all of his enthusiasm. Uh, he goes from uh, being, quote unquote, confident and to being on, uh, in panic mode. So uh, I'm trying to find the video so that way people could uh, watch so it. So we've uh, we've already had a bunch of crazy people today. Can we uh, can we be like happy and polite, or is that is that not uh, possible for for you two guys talking? No, we can, oh we no, I'm talk. To, no, I'm totally capable. What I want to hear is is I want I, I'd love to hear Stanley educate the Christians on the panel, which is kind of everybody else. I want him to explain the seven day cycle. And, yeah. and what I would what I would suggest is is Chris, because um, like well I, I know Yvette I know Tony a little bit but but specifically for for Nate and Chris please ensure you're sitting down. Yeah. I th- I th- wait I think Sabbath or something. I Seven think no, Sabbath. No, that's, that's... wait wait I I think he has mi- I think I remember you said something about a seven day cycle before maybe you didn't get to it or. Yeah, it seems uh, like you've said something about that before. I don't remember at all what it was, though. Yeah, no problem. I, I'll address that, but I'm just going to link. Uh, I've got about yes, 10 minutes, I'm, by the way. This, no problem. So I'm going to link uh, Monsieur Delicieux. Uh, anybody could find it. Monsieur Delicieux versus Michael, the Canadian versus Michael. So yeah, you guys can uh, see. Nate, you, okay, guys so, know, uh, you guys know Jefferson Spatchcock? You guys know no. him, don't you? Oh, you I don't? Oh, know. I don't know anyone. He's, he's, oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, it was. Uh, I, I he, left was the link. he was kind oh. enough to host it on his channel. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so my uh, argument. It's it's boatloads of fun. Watch it. No, it was very very entertaining. Uh, so my argument is predicated. Uh, I'm going to use uh, the inference rule of modus ponens to establish that Jesus is sovereign, and in virtue of that, that makes him God. So uh, premise number one: uh, if Jesus is sovereign, that will make him God. Uh, if no, let me restate that. If Jesus is sovereign over all nations, that will make him God. Uh, Jesus is sovereign over all nations in virtue of the fact that he predicted the universal adoption of the seven-day week as the evidence of his authority over all nations. And lo and behold, all nations keep a seven-day week going against their religious and cultural practices since every calendar was uh, uh, different than a seven-day week. So that's a simple modus ponens. Um, So, uh, Michael, do you have an argument? Uh, do you finally have an argument against what I presented? Because uh, during our debate, uh, you were panicking. Well, no, no. The, the funniest thing about that is, is, is how quickly your argument breaks down because you begged the question in your first statement. So your, so your first premise begs the question. So, mm-hmm. so your, so, so what I will say is, the okay. argument you you have presented has validity, right? But in order, but in order, and this is something you don't seem to be able to comprehend. Um, but in order for the premise is, in order for the conclusion to logically follow, an argument must not only be valid, but it must also be sound. So in order for your argument to make any sense on the little place we call Earth, it has to be sound. So if you can, and, and if you can do that, if you can demonstrate the soundness of your premises, then you will have done what no one has ever done, which is demonstrate the existence of the God you think is real. So that is my rebuttal to your ridiculous argument. You know, you know what's ridiculous is that you argue from two dis- different perspectives and you're trying to make yourself sound logical. First, you were arguing for, you said, I was begging the question. If I'm begging the question, then my argument is not um, valid because a modus ponens doesn't beg the question. My first premise is based on a conditional statement. Uh, obviously, you don't know that simple concept. So if Jesus is sovereign over all creation, that will make him God. So that's it. Uh, to be God, you need the characteristic or the property of being sovereign. So there's no begging the question here. Again, it was a you just did. Uh, you I'm just gonna, did, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, I'm gonna. You I'm gonna just go, did. I'm a, I heard. I heard you say. It. I just did. But yeah, I'm gonna go slowly. Did. I'm gonna go slowly for you again. It's a conditional statement. You don't I'm gonna, have to be modest. I'm gonna. I'm gonna with me. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna replace God. And I'm, I'm gonna do it with a human analogy. If I'm able to demonstrate I have X Y G uh, X Y chromosomes. That will make me a man. Is that That's me a category the question? error? How is that a category error? Because you're replacing God with a man. So, so are you saying that God and men are of the same category of creatures? Wow. So, Michael, Michael, try, that's, that's what I meant. Like, watch my debate against this guy. My friend, the only difference I made, I just showed you my first premise, a conditional statement. 
if I have XY chromosomes, which is necessary for me to be a man, for me to be a man, I have to have XY chromosomes. So you said I was begging the question. All I did is replace God and use a human analogy to show you there is no begging the question because all I'm doing is showing you that for me to be a man, I have to have XY chromosomes. So likewise, for me to, uh, for Jesus to be God, he has to be sovereign. Where's begging the question there? There is no begging the question. <laughs> Is that your uh, response? No, I is love how you response? don't get it. I love how you don't get it. But get honestly, what? honestly, I'm get what Stanley. Get what? Stanley. Get what? Stanley? Yeah, go ahead. I'm done talking to you. I, I, I expected that. Exactly what <laughs> happened during our debate. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, notice, Okay, great. Notice... Harold Harold, you're back. Do you have anything to say or perhaps to do a magic trick and you can uh, impale me with a sword from where you are by telekinetics? Put the hammer away, Nate. Nate. <laughs> Put the wood chipper down. It's getting harder and harder to do. LOL. No, I'm good, man. I, I actually, uh, speaking of magic tricks, it was something new I just learned yesterday um, that I'll be trying out tonight at my gig. So, but yeah, no, nah, man, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm cooling out, chilling, you know, that's all, listening. Bro, Chris, did you make you it inside? I did make it inside, but then the office is locked, but I have to get to the network equipment <laughs> list, so now I'm waiting on the manager. Oh, boy. Are they feeding you while you wait? I mean, it's 9.53. I don't, I don't, I mean, maybe there's some way less rancheros in there, but I already had a bagel for breakfast, so I'm not hungry. Was it like a real Montreal-style bagel? Ooh, chewy I don't know, stuff. maybe. So I Was had, it really um, chewy? So it was kind of chewy. This is a New York style bagel, I guess. But like, oh yeah, uh, that, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. They're they're pretty much a cordial. They're a cordial, yeah. Uh, see, I've never been to Montreal, so Great I've city. listened to of Montreal. It's a good band. Um, let's see. No, I, so I had a bacon, egg, and cheese bagel this morning and yesterday morning with poppy seed. Um, I've got. Um, I've got uh, lox and bagel I had yesterday morning. So that was the, the capers and the onions and the tomatoes and the lox on uh, poppy seed with low fat cream cheese. It was delicious. I got a funny story about poppy seeds. Um, in my early days as a social worker, um, we'd pick, uh, pick kids up and uh, sometimes they had to go to probation meetings and if they had used, if they were on probation for, well, whatever it was they were on probation for, typically one of their conditions of probation would be they couldn't use drugs and stuff like that. So very early on, I, I didn't, I didn't know this yet. Um, but um, if you eat like a poppy seed bagel and then you take a drug test, you can actually the fail the drug test because of the poppy seeds. So what the kids would do is they know that they, you know, they knew that they had smoked pot or something like that the night before. So, you know, in, att in an attempt to be nice, you know, on the way to the probation meeting or something like that, uh, you know, say, hey, do you want to have breakfast? And they'd say, yeah, uh, you know, let's go to Tim Hortons or something like that. Oh, what do you want? Oh, a poppy seed bagel with cream cheese. And then when they'd be talking to the probation officer, um, you know, they sometimes or sometimes they'd walk in the door with the bagel and they'd be eating it and the probation officer would look at them and know what they had done because they'd be like oh man you just you know <laughs> it, uh, it's this, very uh, very funny just uh for the uh the edification of the people in the crowd the fallacy of begging the question occurs when an argument's premises assume the truth of the conclusion instead of supporting it in other words you assume without proof the stand slash position or a sign significant part of the stand that is in question. Begging the question is also call called arguing in circle. So yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, um, a conditional statement does not apply to that definition. Thank you. Sure, sure. Um. No, you know, Nate, uh, just to keep things simple for people who have uh, problems understanding sim simple co concepts. Oh, hey, Nate, I had an epiphany yesterday. I, um, this morning, later this morning, about an hour, um, I got authorization to meet with a consultant to break up 
the uh, the mass of people that are now reporting to me. And uh, if I'm successful in doing this, then I may not want to find the tallest building in my area and jump off of it. Oh, so I don't have to send you the wood chef for, uh, after I'm done with it. <laughs> no, no. It, it's, it's funny because I, so I'm in the process right now of divvying up my caseload because I won't have the capacity, like I won't have the capacity to have a caseload anymore. Um, and so I don't, I didn't really want to do that. I, one of the things I like about my job is my, inter, is my interaction with clients. And so I was sitting down thinking about it and then I bounced the idea off my wife and she's like, well, why don't you just break it up? She's like, if, if this is, if this is, if you're the boss now, then why don't you just break it up and make it so that it'll work better? And I talked to my boss and she was like, well, yeah, you can do that if you really want to. I can't hire anybody else, but I can break it up. And yeah, yeah. So I can't, I can't hire anybody else, but what I can do is I can basically duplicate my former position and break up the people so that I can take it down to a more reasonable level. Because when I was sitting and looking at everything over the last few days, what I realized was I'm going to spend probably 50 hours a week just reading and writing reports, <laughs> which is not my idea of fun. That does not sound fun, but hopefully this, uh, this will work well for you. Have you impl implemented your new uh, approach yet? No, I meet with a consultant in about an hour to... Um, basically present my idea and then get their thoughts on my ideas and whether or not, whether or not it can be implemented and what the process would be to implement it and a timeline and all that other stuff. It, it's far outside my wheelhouse of expertise. Like I, I mean, man, like the difference between managing 20 some people and then you know, 200 and some people is mind boggling. At least to me. But that's only because I'm not that smart. Just ask Stanley. Hey, um, Mark. Welcome back. I am, I'm I'm going to be at that restaurant at 11. I am, I am dying for some tacos. It's Taco Tuesday. Uh, go ahead, Michael. That's <laughs> just shouting out to Mark down there. Isn't it just taco whatever day of the week it is? Isn't that, you know? Well, no, Taco tacos. Tuesday, they have, a, they have, like, specials. Oh, okay. You don't have Taco that. Tuesday in Canada? Wait, you don't have Taco Tuesday in Canada? Um, not that I'm aware of. That's a yeah, tradition. That's like a, yeah, that's like a big thing. It's like, uh, they have like, yeah, like lunch specials and stuff usually at places on uh, Tuesdays. Taco Tuesday. Hmm. No. For example, it's normally like three and four dollars for a taco. And on Taco Tuesday at this place, it is, it's like two and three dollars, um, depending on the taco. So, you know, you save a little bit. As long as they're metabolically good and, and what they're do we, fine to eat everything <laughs> carbohydrates they want. And as Americans, what do we do when we uh, when there's cheap tacos? Do we just appreciate it and save the money? No, we order extra. <laughs> invite me, please. Sure, you're invited. Come to Florida. <laughs> That's a good state from America. Any other state I wouldn't trust, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, people are moving here like crazy. Like the, That's interesting. Like, I would. Oh, oh, yeah. People complain about it, but they, they sure move here. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, I, I don't know. In like probably the next 10 years, we're going to have to go somewhere else because uh, it, it's going to get so full of people, we're just going to sink. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. Or, um, I, I mean, they're just building so much stuff. and they're So, I mean, there's only so much land that hasn't been built on. Like, I, th I think where I am is, like, one of the last, like, coastal places that's not just, like, insane but now it's getting insane because everyone's coming here because it's one of the last coastal places. Um, so, so yeah, like ev everywhere I go, there's just construction everywhere. Um, so we'll see what happens. Read this report that um, they're running out of, at least in North America, they're running out of the sand aggregate used to make concrete. Hmm. Um that they're having to, so like in Ontario now, there's a place, the, the big the big cement place in Ontario is called St. Mary's Cement. And they actually channel 
to the bottom of Lake Ontario and pull the sand out from from there because there's no more sand anywhere else. Wow. Which I found interesting. I guess we can just go to the deserts. I don't think they're going to run out of sand. Is Random on stage? Uh, no. No, let's see if no. Random wants to come on stage. Feel free to come on stage, Random, if you like. Yeah, because he seems to have some uh, questions about my argument. Oh. I have until the end of this Fortnite battle. Well, I did send him an invite. Michael, I hope your consulting thing goes well. Uh, I hope so too. Uh, I guess the thing, the, the biggest thing is just going to be the implementation of it. Um, my hope, I kind of just sketched some stuff out on paper last night. My hope is to break it down into three groups of about 80. So, um, yeah, that would be my hope. Because because within within the within the two hundred and twenty five are eight were eight other people like I was. So eight of those people had around you know twenty or so ish direct reports, and now I have um, eight direct reports which have the twenty or so below that. But what I'm trying to do is break it into smaller groups so that. It's a little easier for me, but it's also easier for the other people too. That's my hope. I have I don't even know if it's gonna work. Math is hard. I do not like math. Not not a fan at all. Um a lot of things are hard for you. Trust me. Thanks, I guess. One of the no, things I, was, I wasn't talking to you, yeah. Nate. I was talking to Michael here. Oh. You know, one, of the, one of the things I love about, you know, one of the things I love when I see it so commonly displayed, and I'm sure you'll be able to smell the sarcasm from Florida, Nate, is, uh, is the... Is you the, guys boxing gloves. Is the, is the, the charity of, uh, of some uh, professing Christians. Oh, there was a lot of that going around earlier. Yeah, I I don't know, man. <laughs> oh, Random's on stage. Are you speaking Random? I am not. Uh, I will only entertain this syllogism in the voice chat as long as Nate is okay with it. Uh, sure. Nate's just counting down the time until I can go have some tacos. Perfect. So, so random. You seem to understand that uh, there was no beg in the question. So at least you you have some some type of brain uh, brain activity. So what is your objection? Uh, oh, so boy. so your your premise one uh, is not necessarily the case because I can because uh, I can think of a situation wherein someone could be quote rule over nations and not in fact be god because yeah. god has many qualities other than just being rule other than ruling over nations yeah. and so it doesn't necessarily follow that just because you rule over nations you are god okay so uh since we are uh, appealing to scripture on the definition of god so we have to do an internal critique and apply first principles hermeneutics and normative standards so as it relates to that, uh, only God could be sovereign over all nations. If you would be able to give me an example through history, or if it would be possible in the future for someone to be sovereign over all nations, uh, you would falsify my position and uh, uh, basically disprove Christianity. So you don't have any examples in history. You don't have any example in history. And uh, I guess we're going to have to wait in the future to see if that ever happens. So, so what you're saying is only God can be can rule over all nations. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. As per the definition of God according to Scripture, if you can, if there's any possibility of anyone being sovereign of, over all nations, then Christianity is false. I mean, I, I guess therein lies the the disagreement between us, because that I 
I just disagree. <laughs> no, no, There's, I understand. I mean, I, I, it, you're, 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 you're assuming the definition of God. I guess you're assuming that just, I'm sorry, let me, let me, let me recalibrate yeah, my th- thought. Think about it. Think about it before you say it. Because I, I just told you, according to first principles, hermeneutics, and normative standards, to be God, one of the characteristics and property of being God is to be sovereign over his creation and be sovereign over all nations. So in virtue of that, uh, nobody else could ha- uh, have that uh, um, attribute, you can say, or a qualification. So if anyone was able to demonstrate their sovereignty over all nations besides God, then Christianity is false. So yes, that will be a way to falsify my position. But you cannot say that the definition of God doesn't mean to be sovereign over all nations, because as per the narrative, that's what it means to be God. Okay, so if there exists a time when there's, let's say, a president of the world, that would disprove Christianity. Exactly. Hmm. All right, I'm cool with that. Yeah, and that's never going to happen. So um, Jesus. Is well, that's. Son. I mean, you you don't know that that's not going to happen. So like, I, I feel like your statement is almost defeated in of itself. Yeah, but you're then, you're, I mean, you're basically but forming. Head, head, head well, for the know. record, let me just throw in a little thing for myself as a Christian. I would you know default to the Bible and say the way to falsify Christianity is go dig up dead Jesus. Um, if Jesus rose, Christianity is correct. If he did not, there's your falsification. Carry yeah, on. That, that, that's a, another means of falsification. Uh, uh, but I, I have one that's more feasible. Uh, um, I could demonstrate that Jesus did resurrect and is at the right hand of, of the Father in virtue of Psalms 2, 7 and Psalms 110, verses 1 and 5, where it says he would submit all nations. Psalms 2, uh, Psalms 2, the whole chapter is about Jesus being at the right hand of God and submitting all nations. And we see that has been fulfilled by the fact that everybody adopts a seven-day week going against their religious and cultural practices. So we, here's the difference between me and you, Random. I've already demonstrated Jesus is sovereign. You're waiting for somebody no. to undermine. No, you really didn't. <laughs> no, no, so, but you, so you haven't argued. Because, wait, wait, Random. Just, uh, just to finalize. Just to finalize. The, I'm just arguing finalize. against your point. Okay, but this so is finalized. I, that was not your original uh, point of contention. Your original point of contention it was, is... It, no, no, that was one okay. of my points of contention. Yeah, but I addressed it. So now you could go to your second point. Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So so just because people use the seven-day week doesn't mean they are by any means specifically obligated to use the seven-day week. So it's basically by choice that people use a seven-day week. And it's because of that choice that somehow that dictates some level of sovereignty? No, that's not what I... Uh, first of all, this base is predicated on a prediction. And uh, it, the fact that it's universal, going against every nation's cultural and religious practices. In other words, uh, Rome kept the eight-day cycle for the, uh, for cultural and religious practices. Uh, China kept to a 10-day cycle for their religious practices. Japan, likewise. Greeks, likewise. Uh, Sumerian kept a lunar cycle for religious practices. Babylonia, uh, Babylonia kept to a lunar cycle as well for religious. Every nation kept to a, a weekly cycle uh, or a calendar for religious and cultural purposes, architecture, religion, uh, uh, social uh, uh, practices, all of that was linked to that those calendar. So the fact that they all went against their cultural and religious practices to adopt a seven-day week, which was specifically Hebraic, shows the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wait, so, so you're saying real quick. Amen. Yes, so I agree. Whoever that, said amen, I agree. So you're saying that they used to go by not a seven-day week. Is that correct? Amen. Very good. So because they used to go by a seven day week, it means that the sovereignty was not universal. It didn't encompass all of time. And if it didn't encompass all of time, then does that mean his sovereignty doesn't encompass all of time? No, no. His issue has the issue. I argue for Jesus being sovereign. God is sovereign in virtue of the fact that he leased the nations to the false gods as per Deuteronomy 32 verse eight. He says, and specifically, I will uh, allow the quote unquote fallen angels to govern over the nations, but I will make Israel my heritage. And once you go through the whole Hebrew scriptures, you see the uh, a consistency consistency as as per God saying that He will use the seven day cycle as the sign of His authority over all the nations. So He said He would replace our calendar, showing that He is God not only over the nations but also over the gods of the nations. So the fact that God leads the nations doesn't mean He's not sovereign over the earth, because the earth belongs to Him. And he has uh, revoked us uh, the lease. And now Jesus is sovereign. So I, I want to make it clear. I was arguing for Jesus, the one who was uh, bega- uh, who came 2,000 years ago and who was at the right hand of the Father. But God, before the incarnation, was also so sovereign. G- so Jesus hasn't always been sovereign? No, because he only came 2,000 years ago. 
Wait, what? Uh, okay. The human Jesus, the human Jesus, the incarnate. Okay. Random, random, random. Um, I'm gonna say it again. The human incarnation of Jesus came two thousand years ago. He inherited everything from the Father, but the Father was sovereign over all nations because he leased the nations. So he has the lease over the nations, although he allowed the nations to be governed by the fallen angels, according to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, and Psalms 82, the whole chapter. So, um, yeah, um, God was always sovereign, but he leased the, na uh, uh, the nations to the fallen gods, and he used his son, and, and his son is the one who will inherit everything, Psalms 2, verses 1 to 7, uh, the whole chapter. Every knee shall bow to Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. And they're already doing that by the fact that they keep to, uh, to a seven-day week, so they're submitted to Jesus Christ. So I address both of your uh, points. Uh, like I said, I have a channel. I've addressed Michael. He's another person on the list. Um, so um, every, every person that tries to argue and gets this infallible argument uh, gets uh, um, exposed. So I, I would advise you to stop. Is this a debate, um, is this, is this a debate yeah. among Christians? I, I, yeah, I, I, love, I, I, I love the way I Nate mean, sighed there. I like the way Nate sighed. Stanley, I, I still reject both of your points. Like, yeah, but I, I, just, but I just them. Do not but follow. I them. No, no, it does follow. Now you're arguing a different whole issue. Now this is your third point. But I address your first two points, and it does follow, because if he's sovereign, then he's God. Uh, that's, uh, again, according to first principles. Can we all agree that Jesus is Lord and sure. God? You don't have to agree, but they're submitted to Jesus either way, so it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Hey, Nate, I'd love to stay longer, but I'm not going to. Um, Thank you. I'd actually love to leave, but I'm in the middle of a game. <laughs> pass it over. Pa pass it over to Chris. I'm sure Chris would have could have some fun with. Uh, I'm sorry, my my son kept interrupting me, so I didn't follow everything. Oh, I'm done. Correctly. Praise Jesus. Yeah, Chris uh, was talking in the chat, but he's not talking now because um, he knows if he tries, uh, it's going to be the same thing I did uh, with uh, Michael, the Canadian guy. Random. Wait, are you and Chris? Are you and Chris at odds now? No, but Chris was talking in the chat saying I, I need to get myself checked, and I said thank you, Doctor Phil. We all have to get ourselves checked, you know. No, I'm a Christian. No. I don't have to, I, my wellness comes from Christ, not from uh, so-called specialists. Yeah, this is, that's what I said. But like I was busy with my baby, so I didn't follow the whole conversation properly. But yeah. Oh, you followed it as well as anybody else. All right, everyone. I'm out of here. Thank you. Take care, and we'll see you guys all later. <laughs>